Good evening and welcome. My name is Joanna Kerr. I'm a librarian here at the Central Library. Uh, I'll be your moderator for tonight. And we also have Dana behind the scenes helping out if she wants to give a wave. Uh, and of course, a warm welcome to Eli Baxter and Bob Baxter, who will meet very soon. Hello. Just a quick note, live transcript is available. If you'd like to see closed captions during our program, uh, to enable them, click on the box in your Zoom screen, normally located at the bottom of your screen that has the letters CC on it with live transcript. Uh, there are limitations to this service. I should let you know it only transcribes in English, unfortunately, and is affected by volume uh, levels and background noises. Full captions will be available with the recording of this program. We are recording our session tonight, um, which will be available on the library's YouTube channel at the end of the series. So um, with that, let me start to share my screen. And um, yeah, just one moment. Lots of, as I say, lots of windows open here. Just gonna do one more thing. There we go. All right, we've got it. Thanks for your patience, everyone. All right. And I'm just going to pull that over and go back to where we were here. Right. Okay, we'll take a deep breath and we'll get back on track. So here we are at our session tonight, Hunting and Gathering Society, Life on the Trap Line with Eli Baxter and Bob Baxter. And um, we'll start tonight um, with an acknowledgement. So I'm joining you um, from London here tonight at our central library. Uh, London's library system is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek as well as the Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, Lunapewak, and neutral peoples. The Crown Treaties in this territory are known as the Upper Canada Land Surrenders. These treaties continue to be living treaties. The Indigenous communities in this region include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of this land. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples endure, and we are grateful for the opportunity to live and to gather here. May we all recognize our own responsibility and gratitude in the stewardship of this land. We invite you to read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and to reflect on acts of allyship with and actions to support Indigenous communities. The link to these calls to action is being shared in the chat. Acts to raise awareness and take personal action could include reading books by Indigenous authors, a selection of which will be included in the follow-up email after this program, or by connecting with local Indigenous serving organizations. Thank you for reflecting on this acknowledgement and invitation to personal action. I am honored to be here tonight and to listen, to share, and to learn with all of you. We'll take a look at our agenda. Uh, we're going to be meeting Eli Baxter and Bob Baxter, and then we'll hear from each of them. Uh, then uh, they'll share some stories with each other before our question and answer period. Just want to remind everyone to submit your questions in the Q&A box. Feel free to type your questions there anytime, um, and then informal greetings in the chat. It's our intention to offer a welcoming and inclusive environment for everyone. Please reflect on this as you share your thoughts and your questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now. Great, okay. Excellent. So uh, with that, we're ready to introduce our guests for tonight. And we'll start with Eli Baxter. So Eli Baxter was born in an Ojibwe community 500 kilometers northeast of Thunder Bay, Ontario. A member of the Caribou clan, Baxter was raised in the traditional way on the trap line along the Albany River. Ojibwe is his first language. After receiving a degree and teaching certificate from Lakehead University, Baxter taught elementary grades in White Dog, Ontario. 
He then taught the Ojibwe language from junior kindergarten to grade eight on the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation. At Western University, Baxter designed, wrote, and taught the Algonquin language and culture course for 17 years. He has contributed to the Anishinaabek news media and remains active in policy and research affecting Indigenous law and language. Eli's book, A Person as Worthy as the Earth, was published last year by McGill Queen's University Press. The book is available to borrow from London Public Library. We'll add that link in the chat if you want to place a hold. I think we've got about five holds on it right now. Um, and if you're interested, the Western University Bookstore also sells this book. And we'll also include that link in the chat if you want to take a look. I'm also going to introduce Bob Baxter now, and then we'll have them each introduce uh, themselves. Uh, but Bob is an, an Anishinaabe from Martin Falls First Nation, currently living in Thunder Bay. Bob grew up on his parents' trap line on the Albany River in Northern Ontario. He is a retired police officer and was previously a counselor for Martin Falls First Nation. He currently works with his community on projects related to land use planning. He is an Eagle Staff Carrier for Anishinaabe Aske Police Service and is a speaker on Native Cultural Awareness. He volunteers at the Indigenous Friendship Center and also participates on the local school board's Indigenous Liaison Advisory Groups. Bob is a residential school survivor and shares his experiences to educate others on the impact of the residential school system on Indigenous people. He still enjoys the traditional way of life as taught by his parents, spending his free time hunting, snowshoeing, going on river adventures and preserving his cultural and spiritual practices and he is Eli Baxter's cousin. A warm welcome to both of you. Uh, we're going to start tonight with a short conversation with you to hear some of the stories behind the introductions I just read, but I'll start first by inviting each of you to offer your own introductions and words of welcome. Eli, I'll invite you to share your welcome. Uh, 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 my name is Eli Baxter. I'm from uh, Ogoki Post, and uh, my clan is the Atik. Uh, the caribou clan. And uh, one of the things uh, I said was uh, uh, bonjour to all my relations, friends, and the people that uh, came to uh, listen uh, and watch this uh, presentation. Uh, uh, the reason why we're here is because uh, I've written this book uh, called Acuense, uh, a person uh, as worthy as the earth, I don't know if you could see that, yeah. And uh, it's uh, uh, it's about Anishinaabe life uh, before European contact, uh, and it's about uh, what Bobby and I and uh, other Anishinaabe of our generation had experienced uh, growing up uh, uh, in our. Uh, uh, trap lines or communities up north, uh, northern Ontario, and uh, our experiences uh, that we had as we were growing up, or uh, I wrote in this book, uh, growing up as uh, kids uh, along the Albany River, uh, only speaking the uh, the Ojibwe language and not knowing uh, a single word of uh, of English. And uh, also uh, a great uh, looking back uh, at how we uh, how we lived uh, on the land, uh, off the land, and watching our uh, moms and dads, aunts and uncles, grandparents, how uh, how they interacted with the land. So that's why uh, okay. Uh, Akiwenze is uh, about 
how uh, that term was given to uh, elders because the elders uh, that uh, came before us knew the, uh, the history of the land and also the, uh, all the secrets uh, of the land. So they were, they were almost at the same level as, uh, as, as the earth, uh, I'll say. And uh, hmm, uh, I'll talk about my, uh, 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 our experiences uh, as we're growing up, growing up uh, on the Albany River. Oh, uh, Thank you, Eli. And uh, I'll invite Bob now. Um, just, I'll just check in with Bob to see. There he is. Bob, can you hear us? Oh, I can hear you. That's good. Okay, we can't see you right now, but we can work on that. Um, I if, got the camera on. Okay. No. Let's see. I'm just going to... Let's work on this here. I was on there earlier, I think. Yeah, yeah. We saw you earlier for sure. Um, I'll just... Well, while we work on that, um, Bob, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, for sure. Hi there, everybody. Bonjour. Can you And hello. Um, I'm an Ojibwe from uh, an Ojibwe person from uh, Martin Falls First Nations. I am uh, 73 years old, getting up there. A couple of more years, I'll be three quarters of a century old. Holy mackerel! Anyway, uh, I'm. I'm uh, I'm very honored to be a part of this uh, session that's going on right now to uh, to assist uh, my cousin Eli to share some stories of uh, way back when, when we were young, and uh, to try and educate uh, people, you know, how, uh, how uh, the experiences we had as uh, children and uh, before we go, before we were uh, sent over to a residential school, and um, I have lots of experiences uh, in the uh, in the land. Uh, I like to consider myself as part of the land of where we were, where we were, where we were born there on the Albany River, and. Uh, even though I went to residential school, I went back there after when I was able to learn the, the ways of my dad, you know, the, to learn the ways of uh, our people, how they survived up there. If, I, if, uh, if they gave out, uh, uh, you know, big achievement uh, awards for, uh, for being the best woodsman, maybe I think I'll be, I'd be right up there with the others yeah, because of the knowledge I picked up, uh, you know, just uh, from my parents and from my, you know, other people that I've, uh, that I've uh, encountered up there on the trap lines and, uh, and the knowledge that I got from them, you know, the stories they gave me and stuff like that. So uh, I'll be, I, Thanks, I yeah, uh, I volunteered to come here to uh, you know to be part of this, and I hope I can be a help and at least uh, provide some light uh, with uh, Eli. Absolutely. Be which. Yes, thanks, Bob. Um, and just before we start um, chatting with Eli, Bob, do you want to just check the um, just on the bottom left of your Zoom screen if it says um, start video just by the microphone? Start video. It yeah. says stop video, start with. I got a stop video on it. I see mm. a stop video. Video not... setting. Yep. You might want to pick a different camera, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, 
But Indeed. at this point, I think what we'll do, yeah, it just might be picking up the wrong camera. Could be. So yeah, when you click on that little arrow by stop video, there might be select a camera, there might be a better choice there, whatever is built into your computer or just before we get chatting. Video. No problem otherwise. That's okay. You know what? Let's just jump into our discussion. And maybe when Eli's chatting, um, you can um, play with the settings a bit and we'll see where we can get with that. But if it's okay, okay. Let's, let's go ahead with the question. So now we're going to just have um, so a few minutes to chat with Bob and Eli just to get some of the stories behind the bios that I read. So Bob, um, I just wanted to start by inviting you to start by sharing um, one of your happy childhood memories that you have growing up on your parents' trap line. All right, um, you know when you're uh, when you're when you're just a young uh, young boy, you you know you learn from your, your your dad. You watch what your dad does, and you hear the stories that he tells. So uh, I guess uh, one of my uh, favorite memories is uh, the uh, just the stories that. Uh, the stories that my uh, dad used to tell us, you know, the legends and stuff like that. Those are those are my favorite mem. One of my favorite memories is uh, you know the the teachings that he gave us through legends and uh, and also the the work that he, just watching him do things like uh, you know how he uh, how he used to in, involve us involve us and when he was cutting wood and uh, we used to go with him, you know, and uh, put us on a sleigh and stuff like that. Uh, that was good memories. And uh, and uh, some of the legends, of course, that we, uh, we had, uh, you know, were, uh, you know, they stay with you and uh, you learn from them. And uh, I don't know if you had a, I don't know if you had me to tell you about a legend or what. I think what we'll do, um, yeah, I think we'll hear the legend a little later on. Um, but what I'll do now, just in this first segment that we're doing is I'll invite Eli to come in uh, with the same question um, to share um, a happy childhood memory as well with us and join us here in conversation. Uh, happy childhood uh, memory uh, was uh, as uh, Bobby and I uh, had uh, experienced that along with our brothers and sisters and our uh, cousins uh, was uh, uh, during the uh, during the summertime uh, we would all what we call Pamashigame. The Pamashigame is uh, we would walk uh, back and forth uh, along the shoreline. Uh, especially at uh, where we, uh, our main trapping camp was at Washi Lake. It was a big lake. It was about, it was about two parts to it. And uh, where our cabins were, uh, they were a rocky uh, shore, uh, shoreline. And then uh, we would go up uh, to this bend. And then after that, there was about, uh, oh, geez quarter mile of uh, sandy beach that went to a point and uh, we go swimming there and and do all that kind of stuff uh, but one of the things we used to do was uh, take a pail uh, huge pails and then we would uh, fill them with water and then uh, we would walk along the uh, 
along the shore with uh, her hands pulled up, uh, pant legs. And then we would uncover a huge flat rocks very slowly. And, in, and underneath would be muzai, which is a baby uh, catfish, uh, but black is about this big, sometimes uh, uh, bigger. And we had coconut uh, I'm not sure what the English translation of that is, but it's just a little, uh, a little fish like this, a big body and a small tail and huge uh, fins. And he was a bottom feeder. And then the other thing we would find there is a shagish. And a shagish was these cra uh, crabs. And uh, so uh, was always, those crabs always frightened us. Uh, we had to uh, try to get that stuff. But the, the other fish, uh, the Pocacanachu and the uh, Mazai, uh, the baby catfish, we would scoop, scoop them up with our hands like that and then put them in the pails. And then we would do that for, uh, let's say, uh, the whole morning. And then, the, uh, and then uh, after that, we would look over our catches and see which fish was the biggest, which was more colorful, and uh, which was the smallest. And uh, so we had a little competition with that. And then after that, we, uh, we would take the pels and we, uh, then we put the, uh, the fish uh, back uh, into the water. And uh, another thing was uh, our parents uh, used to do uh, commercial fishing for this one uh, gentleman, his name was Cody. And he used to come in uh, uh, every two weeks. And, uh, and all the fish that my parents and my aunt and uncle caught, uh, there were all types uh, of uh, fish like ogas, which is the pickerel, and the, uh, sometimes there's trout, there's pike, and then uh, sometimes there's perch. But the biggest one was the uh, uh, the sturgeon, and the sturgeons got really big, and uh, some of them were like you know over a hundred pounds, uh, over seven feet. And these guys are bottom feeders, and they have a suction cup uh, uh, that retracts uh, into the uh, uh, into their body uh, at the bottom of their heads. And they just glide along uh, at, the, at the bottom of the lakes and they suck up all these insects and stuff like that. So it's like a vacuum cleaner. And they grew up uh, pretty, and they had this white uh, belly and these uh, dark uh, top. And then they had these uh, sharp uh, edges to them. So they're pretty pre prehistoric. And they had this uh, like armor. Uh, covering the the top uh, the top part of their bodies, and but they're so big that uh, because it's every two weeks the uh, the guy would come to pick up the fish. Uh, all the smaller fish were gutted and cleaned and put on. Uh, we had a nice house uh, uh, just down uh, down from where we lived, and then uh, but the uh, the sturgeon. Uh, they get a string and put it through the gills and through the mouth and tie them there and then just let them out and uh, graze, I guess, uh, uh, further out into the lake. And then they would have wooden stakes along the shore where they would tie them. And uh, so one of the things I would do when my mom and dad uh, weren't looking uh, or my older uh, sister's uh, weren't looking, was uh, I would go and find where the biggest uh, sturgeon was, and then I'd pull it in by uh, the string really slowly, and then there's this huge, like, black uh, a thing slowly coming towards you as, as you're pulling it in, and then I would turn it around after, when it, when it got into the shallows, and I'd point it towards uh, the deep uh, part of the lake, and then 
I would grab the tail like this really hard. And then they would splash like this. And then they would glide uh, along uh, along the bottom of, of the lake. Uh, it's just like, uh, you know, a black log or a torpedo going uh, away from you. And then uh, just before they disappeared into the deep water, I would pull the, uh, the string and then they would tumble back and forth like that. So, uh, you know, uh, just being a kid, uh, just trying to, you know, look for fun things to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's kind of cruel, but... Uh, so that was one of the uh, things that uh, I used to do. Thanks, and then, the, then the slingshot. So I'll tell you that later. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to the slingshots later for sure. Yeah. Um, and Bob, I just wanted to check in with you um, just to see how things are going. We had a good idea in the chat that maybe your, your camera might be covered, but uh, we can troubleshoot that a bit. I'm just gonna unmute you here. Um, just gonna try something else here. All right, Bob. How's it going over there? I think he's muted. Yeah. Uh, he's really shy anyway. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> well, you know what? What we'll do, um, Eli, instead, we will um, let's move on to your talk. So um, we'll you hear uh, me. Hit, oh, yeah, Bob, we've got you there. Yep. Um, so what we're going to do is we'll we'll um, work on your camera, Bob. But we're, what we're going to do right now is hand it over to Eli to share his talk. So Eli, over to you. Oh, okay. Uh, when I uh, when I wrote this uh, uh, this book, uh, Acuenzi, a person as uh, uh, worthy as as the earth. It's all about the land, and uh, and this is what our education system was uh, when we were growing up, as uh, uh, little Nishnabig, as uh, as uh, as Ojibwe's, and uh, as as we were growing up, that uh, that's all we saw and heard was our parents. Uh, uh, as we were uh, growing up, we heard the Ojibwe language, and. Uh, that is all we uh, we we learned, picked up. So, and I don't uh, I don't really have uh, one to show you guys, but we had ticking agons. It's uh, uh, two boards that my uh, that our dads would have had made, two flat boards, and uh, with uh, a crash bar, a handle. Uh, in front of us, and then, and then uh, uh, we were put in there uh, with uh, these uh, moonside uh, lacings, uh, like a cover, and then, uh, then, but our bodies were also covered in blankets called wapichipism, and uh, and our uh, diaper was uh, this uh, dried moss. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, when we were uh, infants. That's how, uh, uh, how we, uh, and this cradle board uh, thing was like the womb of, uh, uh, of our mothers. It was uh, warm and safe. And uh, the thing too was, uh, well, only our faces uh, were, uh, especially when, uh, when we're laced up, uh, to go to sleep. That's all. Uh, that's all I could see was our uh, our faces, and we can look out and listen uh, uh, all the time. Uh, and then we would sleep on that. But when we woke up as babies, they would untie just part of uh, just the part, so we could uh, our arms are are free, and we'd look around, and and that was our first uh, a year. It, it was it was like that, and and the cradle board we were 
uh, they carried us uh, on their backs with, uh, and they had a little pump line uh, that came across the, the shoulders. So they, uh, they carried us uh, around and they placed us uh, around the activities if they were cooking and uh, doing uh, as my, and, and my dad would be, uh, uh, our dads were you know, great artisans. Uh, they made the snowshoes, they made the toboggans and uh, uh, all the cradle boards. Uh, anything that they had to do with their hands, uh, that's what uh, we will be able to see and hear. And, uh, and also uh, just uh, uh, listen and hear uh, the talk as, as we were growing up. And then, of course, okay, we would try, of course, we would try to talk too. And and then that's how we that's how we picked up the the language uh, uh, as we were uh, as we were uh, growing up. And uh, also there was always uh, older brothers and sisters around around looking after us as as uh, we were babies and toddlers. And uh, of course, our older brothers and sisters would already know how to talk. And we always uh, wanted to talk like them. And uh, so uh, that's how we uh, picked up, uh, how we picked up the language through uh, hearing and uh, observation. And always wanted to do uh, what our older brothers and sisters did. And also wanted to, uh, do what our uh, our moms and dads did, and uh, uh, our mom uh, used to sew uh, all of these things. Here, I'll show you. Uh, these are uh, what my mom made uh, for my partner, and uh, you could see the uh, the Anishinaabe floral design here. And, and it's like that uh, all, it was like that uh, all over uh, as, and of course, <laughs> our, our mom uh, told us as, as we were, as we got older, she couldn't sew uh, or do the sewing uh, when we were awake, uh, because we wanted to, uh, to do it too. Uh, and of course, that, uh, you know, uh, beads would be all over the place and we'd be pricking ourselves and stuff like that. And uh, so she was that she didn't uh, do any of the beading, uh, cutting and sewing until we fell asleep. So uh, after we fell asleep, I guess uh, she would continue uh, sewing under uh, uh, candlelight. And so <laughs> that's a or uh, during the day when we we're outside playing or something like that, she would pick up her sewing uh, uh, things. Uh, so she was always uh, she was always uh, busy uh, uh, doing that. And another thing, as uh, as we were uh, growing up uh, uh, at that time, uh, we would see our father do. Uh, all sorts of things. He had a dog team uh, as uh, when we were small, and the dog, uh, and we had all uh, names for our dogs. And, uh, uh, but they were uh, sled dogs, working dogs, so uh, we really couldn't uh, uh, play with them. But we had a few that uh, we were we were uh, friendly with, and uh, it was. Uh, you know, interesting how our dad used to, you know, feed them. The dogs really responded to uh, going out into the, you know, on the sleigh with that. I remember that. And another thing uh, that I remember my dad doing was making uh, snowshoes here. I'll show you some snowshoes. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, uh, what they call agim. And uh, this is birch, okay? And then uh, this is uh, webbing. This one here is uh, 
thinner than these ones here because of the webbings. Uh, your, your feet goes here like this, boom, boom. And, and this is thicker because uh, they would pound or, or your foot would pound into, into this all day, all day long. I'll just show you how high they are. So, yeah. So this would be the men's uh, snowshoes. And uh, over here, this would be uh, the women's snowshoes. So they're uh, a little uh, smaller. And, uh, but, uh, but, we saw them uh, do uh, do all this uh, all uh, all of this uh, work because uh, this uh, uh, sinew moose uh, sinew uh, we had to get it out of uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the moose so uh, the moose would have to be uh, had to be killed uh, first of all by our dads and. Uh, but for uh, uh, for the for the woman, nigan uh, dam is what they is what they would say about the moose height, and uh, this is actually a deer height. Okay, one side is white and then the other one is uh, is tanned. Okay, so. Uh, uh, with this, this is what they call the smoked hide, okay? Uh, but it looks completely different uh, uh, before it's tanned, okay? So this is a drum that my dad had made long uh, 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 for me. And uh, he also made this uh, drumstick. Yeah. And no, I better not sing. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but I don't have a singing voice. Uh, but this is actually, uh, I don't know if you could see my hand through there, but it's actually uh, uh, trans, uh, transparent. And, and this is dried uh, moose, uh, moose hide that the uh, drum is made out of. Now, this is what this hide looks like after it's been scraped of all the, the hair on one side and also all of the, uh, uh, the meat and the fat from uh, after it's taken off uh, the, the moose that was killed. And uh, the woman, uh, the ladies would uh, say Nigan and Dum, which means uh, the first uh, thought uh, is uh, the moose side. Uh, for uh, for them because they needed to have that moonside to make the moccasins. Now, what we say moccasin uh, 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 for for the kids and also for uh, uh, themselves and, and uh, the adults. So from from here, uh, I, we saw our dad uh, scrape uh, these moonsides uh, right down. Uh, in the, in the middle of winter, so as kids, uh, we saw uh, we saw uh, all the process of uh, getting uh, this this hide. When this side is really thin like this, they would wet it, and when it's wet, uh, our dad would uh, take a knife and then make a circular cut all the way around until uh, you get the. Uh, the thickness of what he wanted for for the for the snowshoes, and then the snowshoes. You see these little dents in here, okay? Uh, they're they're laced uh, into the frame. Uh, so, but this is actually put on when the uh, hide is wet. So it's it's really wet. So, and then they pull it really tight, and then. When it dries, it, it becomes uh, really taut uh, after, so that so that it's uh, uh, these things here, uh, the snowshoes. 
Uh, my dad made these, oh, about 40 years ago now, 40. Yeah, so it's like over 40 years ago. And they're very uh, 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 versatile anyway. And then uh, sometimes uh, they, they walk on these thing, with these things all day. And then uh, when they're making camp, especially in, in, in the wintertime, they would use them for shovels like that. Uh, uh, with uh, with uh, with these things, and then uh, at night they would play like a guitar, like this. Uh, better not sing again. So that's where uh, the, so we saw them uh, do all of those, uh, uh, make uh, all of these uh, 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 these processes that they had to go through in order to make uh, all of these things. And we, and we, and we saw him make uh, well, the two types of uh, toboggans. There's that flat toboggan uh, with the curve. Uh, uh, we saw them make that. And uh, we also saw them make uh, those uh, those tikkanagans I was uh, talking about those uh, cradle boards. And then uh, uh, coming from a hunting and gathering society uh, and learning all of the, uh, uh, watching and learning all of these things, uh, we, uh, uh, we got to see and experience uh, 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 this uh, great uh, way of, uh, knowing how to uh, live off the land. So, but we also had to, wa uh, we also watched them uh, prepare food uh, all, all the time. And also uh, the, especially in the summertime, uh, picking blue, uh, berries, all the different types of uh, berries uh, that, that, that were uh, out there. And also to uh, not to eat uh, certain berries that, that would make you that would make you sick. So we did uh, so uh, we did uh, see and hear uh, them uh, doing all of these uh, all of these things. But uh, as kids, uh, we had uh, we saw how uh, the animals were looked after after they've been killed but as kids uh, we also had uh, we also had our dads make uh, a slingshot uh, especially uh, when we were small and we didn't really know how how to make slingshots yet but uh, our dads uh, would uh, would cut out the, the slingshot with the wooden part and then he would get uh, uh, these rubber bands, uh, and then uh, and then the moon side uh, stuff for, where we would put our uh, uh, our stones in, and then we go hunting ourselves, and uh, we used to go out and kill uh, birds. Uh, we uh, and uh, but we were so proud to go and show them to our parents after we killed them. And uh, but uh, but as we got uh, older, we started to learn how to uh, hunt for food, like partridge. There's all a couple of types of partridge that we would hunt for, especially in the summertime, and uh, and we were able to bring food uh, uh, with our with our slingshots uh, uh, for that and. <laughs> Uh, our old, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a sister that is uh, who is a tomboy, uh, and she used to uh, oh, she was amazing with uh, uh, with uh, uh, slingshots, and she would uh, put us to shame and stuff like that about uh, you know how good her uh, her aim was. Well. Uh, uh, playing or going with uh, slingshots, and uh, I remember one one time there was uh, chiwegano, and chiwegano is a uh, dragonfly, and this one dragonfly we saw uh, fly like this, 
and the uh, on, uh, close to the water or just above the water. And uh, I remember my sister Wanda uh, shooting it with a slingshot like that, boom. And then uh, she would knock the head off that uh, off that uh, dragonfly as the dragonfly is flying, and the dragonfly would keep flying without a head. That's how good uh, of a hunter she was. So, uh, growing up uh, along uh, the along Washilika and all along the uh, the shore there, uh, we uh, we did uh, we did a lot of things together with uh, uh, brothers and sisters, and also with our uh, cousins who are about the same age as us, and. Uh, I know that uh, at Washi Lake, I was with my, uh, uh, we lived with uh, Uncle uh, Uncle uh, Chon, Iban. Uh, I used to call him Johnny. And uh, he had uh, his, his kids there. And uh, so it was always uh, my, my dad and uncle uh, there uh, with their families. Uh, hunting and trapping uh, together as a family, and then further up the river from uh, from us on the Albany River, that's where Bobby and his family were. Uh, his uh, his dad, and then our uncle David uh, Ivan, uh, and his family. And oh, there's a whole mess of them there. Uh, but they would be actually be doing the same thing as we were doing. Uh, 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 but uh, in separate location. So they had their own trap line uh, further up the river from, uh, from us as, uh, as we were growing up. And uh, we basically uh, did the, uh, the, same, uh, the same activities uh, because we were learning these uh, hunting skills and gathering skills uh, as, uh, as kids. And, uh, you know, we would have our own games and uh, things like that. Along the shore, I remember we would pick up all of these different little asinis, you know, all of these little rocks uh, that, uh, that we found. And we would have a collection of them that we would pretend that they were from all these different uh, name places that we would know, like Kegeami, which is one of the biggest uh, falls uh, that we had to portage uh, 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 all the time if we, when we were traveling up and down the river. So that was our, uh, uh, our lifestyle as we were growing up. And then uh, one of the things that was amazing uh, with our families was that uh, uh, none of us never really got lost. Uh, uh, I remember there, oh geez, there must have been about 40 of us Baxters uh, within those two trapping <laughs> uh, camps. And, uh, but none of us never really got sick. And, uh, and none of us really ever got, uh, you know, uh, lost or uh, and we never really had any major accidents like uh, huge uh, cuts uh, with the axe or knives or, or anything like that because uh, that was uh, the main lessons that we got from our parents uh, was uh, to respect uh, the uh, the knife uh, the axe the guns the that our dads used to uh, had uh, all the time. Uh, we had uh, respect uh, for the for the uh, for the guns. Uh, we were told never to touch them, and uh, so we never did. And uh, so, and there was never really any, you know, hunting uh, accidents like that with. Uh, you know, anybody getting a shot accidentally. And uh, so I remember growing up uh, uh, being part of that. 
And remember, it, it wasn't just us that uh, that had these uh, experiences. It was all these other communities uh, north of us, like in North, Northern Ontario, uh, like and all the other prairie provinces too. Uh, the, those families uh, before uh, before uh, we went to residential school, and this these experiences that we're talking about is the stuff before residential school. Eli, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just going to um, let you know that um, if it's okay, what we'll do is invite Bob in to the discussion. Um, I just wanna make sure everything's working with him as well. Um, have him share a bit and then we'll bring sure. it back together. Yeah, so, um, so Bob, can we hear you? That's the question. Oh, can you hear me? Yay, yeah, and we can see okay. this is wonderful. <laughs> okay, Bob, so what I'm gonna do is and I'm gonna invite you to share some stories. In fact, the story that you were mentioning earlier, I'd love to hear uh, that story if you want to tell the one, uh, I think it's with the mink, um, and then show us some of what you have there in your room. Okay. I guess, I guess uh, we bypassed what the family was like before residential school. <laughs> Uh, technology is not one of my best subjects here. That's okay, Bob. Share any stories you like. We have about uh, we have about ten minutes, so um, yeah, we'd love to hear your stories. Okay. Uh, good evening again, whoever's uh, listening. Um, yeah, you know uh, when you grew up, uh, we grew up on the like Eli says we were we're about ten miles. 10, 15 miles up the river from them and about two or three rapids between us. So we didn't get to visit, uh, you know, every day, like, like if we wanted to, because our parents wouldn't want us to go up and down with rivers by ourselves to begin with, because uh, they're dangerous rapids. But uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, I was going to, I was telling you about what our parents used to tell us, you know, the legends and stuff like that, that keep, uh, I think some of these legends, you know, sometimes it was to scare us and, uh, and uh, to, you know, and also to learn, you know, I think the morals of these stories was to keep us, uh, to keep us in line and, uh, and to listen to our parents. Uh, I'll tell you two fast legends. Uh, one is about uh, uh, the moon. Everybody has uh, everybody has legends, and you know, throughout the uh, First Nations communities, they're they're basically the same. Some differ how they're told, but uh, one of the ones is like uh, what Eli says in his book. Uh, you know, you get in water and stuff like that. But, uh, in the winter time, you fill of water, and sometimes you're, you're asked you're asked to go and get it, but us boys you know boys are boys who they don't really we didn't really listen so uh this and this is where the stories come in you know they'll tell the stories and uh, you go you know they says well if you're not going to get that water just uh, and if you're uh and if you're uh you know somebody's gonna somebody's gonna hit somebody's gonna see you not listening to your parents so, and they told us a story about this boy that went down to, this child that went down to the lake to get a pillow of water. And uh, of course, he didn't like to go down. And, uh, and the story that uh, he was told was, you know, there's a boy before uh, that didn't listen, just like you. So uh, he did find it. If, <clears throat> He, uh, he was told that this one certain boy finally went down to go uh, to go get this pail of water, and uh, he, he still wasn't too happy about it. He was told, and uh, he says, "If you don't listen, you know that that moon that moon will come and get you." It was bright, you know. It was in the 
in the full moon. You know, that full moon, somebody is going to come and get you if you don't listen. So I guess this boy, uh, he didn't listen anyway, I guess. And uh, he went down. After a while, he went down and uh, and uh, he never came back up. He never came back up after uh, after he went down to get his water. And uh, his parents uh, and his parents uh, knew that the that the moon came down and got him. So that's what you see on the moon these days: is the reflection of that uh, boy with his pail of water. If you look at closely at the moon. Uh, when it's bright at night, you'll see a you'll see a you'll see a boy up there with his pail of water, and those are the kind of stories we were told. So I know myself that uh, <laughs> I I didn't go down there while the moon was full. Let me tell you, <laughs> and I and I and I went down. If my mom said to go get it, I went and got it. <laughs> so that's the. And the other one is about this, uh, they told us about the story about this mink. This mink is going up and down the river, you know, looking for food. He's hungry and uh, he's starving, actually. And uh, he, comes, he comes to this beaver dam and, uh, and he sees on one end of that pool of that, the, where the water is backed up, and he sees a big pike big pike lying there and it's too big for him he says I was I'm was I'm was I'm and so he couldn't uh, it was too big for him so he couldn't uh, he couldn't uh, get in there and, and get him out so he, so he kept on going to the other side of the dam and, and he sees this walleye that's a uh, walleye on the other end of the pool swimming around and, uh, and uh, the walleye was too big too. So he couldn't get that one. He was, so he had to form a plan on how to get the, how to get this fish because he was so hungry. So he went out, to, so he decided to go back to that big pike and, and uh, <clears throat> animals could talk those days in these legends as I was told. So he, was, he goes back to the pike and tells the pike, oh, that walleye over there, that, that while I was on the other side of the pond there says, you're, you, you're very ugly. You've got, you got a big mouth. And of course, that, uh, of course the pike got uh, angry. And he says, well, you tell that, you tell that walleye, he's, he's got big eyes that are popping out of his head. So, and, uh, so the, the mink went over and told the walleye that. And of course, the walleye sent another arrow back by the with his message telling <laughs> you tell that pike that uh, he's very he's very he stinks and he's very slimy the the, the mink goes and tells that uh, to the pike and, and of course the pike is really mad and uh, you tell that you tell that walleye he's he's not very he's very uh, like he's fat like he's short he's and uh, stuff like that he's Accusations are going back and forth until finally they get mad at each other. So the pike and the and they and they attack each other. And the mink is there, really anxious, is looking at him, and he sees uh, he sees all this bubbling coming up, and all of a sudden he starts seeing blood coming out of the water, and he's telling his and he's telling those two uh, two fishes, "Oh, you guys are." He, you're starting to you're starting to draw blood. You're starting to draw blood. You know stuff like that. <laughs> Finally, these two kill each other. They 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 eventually kill each other, and uh, and uh, the the mink guy got each one of them, and uh, he had a good meal. And uh, I think the moral of that story was just you know just uh, you know if you if, if you're uh, there's difficult these in, in life that you find a way to resolve. I think we may have lost Bob for the moment. We'll just give it a few seconds. All right, I think we may. 
Okay, we may have to check Bob's connection. All right. Oh, there he's back. You're back. We just we just had you frozen for a bit there, Bob. Okay. So you were just finishing the moral of the story. Okay. Did you hear the moral of the story? <laughs> we heard the first part, but if you could give us the last part of the moral of the story. No, it's just that uh, it was something like, uh, you know, like if you, uh, if you face difficult situations or if there's situations that need solving, you know, you got you to gotta think about it. Just like, just like in life, if some hard stuff come your way, you have to find ways to, uh, to resolve them. Thank you for that. Um, do you want to show us some of the items that are behind you? Okay, you can see them. Uh, this, is the, this is the hunter's equipment. So I'm a hunter. So I'm a hunter. What I got here, if you see it, a little design on it. This is a this is a, a rifle case. When I'm when I'm hunting, I I uh, put my uh, thirty thirty in here, my rifle, so it doesn't the snow doesn't get into it and stuff like that when you're going through the bush. So that's what I use. This was a little fancy. It's like a little fat. Sometimes we just make it out of uh, out of uh, cloth and stuff like that. My wife made this for me, so that's what, that's why I keep it. And this one here, these are the my moccasins that are, they're ankle moccasins. That's what I use for uh, when I'm hunting moose when I'm uh, when I'm. Uh, Using my snowshoes and stuff like that. Uh, it's made out of this is made out of moose hide cloth and moose hide uh, strings to uh, lace around your uh, to lace it around your ankles. And I wear I wear these. I put uh, I put about three pairs of socks on, and uh, three or four pairs of socks on plus that uh, felt. And it's really warm, good till 60 below, very good. And uh, I'll tell you, you can walk a long way on snowshoes with these things. Not like if you wear your boots or anything like that. That's these outweigh that. You can walk, uh, you can walk about 30 miles a day with these things, and uh, still keep on going. And of course, they come with these. You know, I had those snowshoes. Oops. These are uh, these are mine. Like uh, this is uh, so this is what I use for when I go hunting, when I follow um, when I follow the moose or any any if I'm trapping. That's what I use. But uh, you know, this is uh, sort of a woman size. This one that I got, I got another, the one I'm the one I got that my camp there. They're they're bigger than this. And uh, we have these lacings on them. These are called them. We call them uh, a timanan. We call them a timanan. These laces. And these are the men. The men. The men. This is what the men use to uh, to travel. This is a new, a unique way to tie to tie this lacing. And you can you can go far with it. You know. You know with the snow. It goes. Uh, it goes good with the moccasins that I just showed you there. Like these are the snowshoes we, we used to go 34 miles a day with when we were trapping. And uh, one thing about these the snowshoes is that uh, you know how the point they have these points here is they don't uh, when you when you when you're walking they don't they don't they don't uh, dive into the snow they stay on top of the snow over here so uh, so you don't trip. And usually the the back end of them here are heavy, are heavier than the front. So uh, sort of when you lift your feet, the front end goes up and the back end goes down. So that's how these things are made. These are uh, or these were made by my uncle uh, Gilbert. And Eli's dad. And uh, 
Uh, they're very useful tools to have up north, and even today. I I see I see I see uh, snowshoes, uh, metal snowshoes out there. What they call snowshoes these days? Holy mackerel! Guys wouldn't survive with those up there. Kill yourself with those snowshoes. Those little metal ones. Those... You need things like this. That's why they were made like that because. Years of experience, you know, from way decades back, you know, my before even before my great grandfather, great grand, you know, that's the kind of that's the kind of uh, equipment that they used to have. That they used to make their own equipment, and uh, you know, everything was at their fingertips. All you had to do is kill the moose, chop the tree down, and marry a woman that knew how to lace snowshoes, and you're on your way. <laughs> uh, thanks bob well, that's great and thanks for the stories um i'm just looking at the time now so i see it's about eight minutes after eight we want to have time for questions so feel free to start putting those in the q and a box whenever you like any questions for bob and eli but while we're waiting i'm just going to jump in um, with a question here there's just so many good stories to share um, uh, but Eli, I'm just going to invite you to come back into the conversation too, because um, there's a phrase in the book, and I apologize if you've already addressed this, uh, Bob and I were just on the phone offline, just troubleshooting. So if you've already addressed this, we'll move on. But uh, a phrase that came up in your book that I wanted to know more about, and I'll just bring you into this conversation uh, there, there we go, um, is the phrase pointing with your lips someone points with their lips can you explain that because in the book i needed an explanation and you've told me about it but i think people might have questions so tell me what is pointing with your lips and why do people do it okay uh when uh, somebody would say i i, I need the bob they, they'd say where's bob say, oh, wait. Uh, you would say <laughs> and of course you know any Anishinaabe that, you know, as a self-respecting Anishinaabe would know exactly where Bob is <laughs> by pointing with, uh, with your lips. Uh, but the thing is, uh, uh, a long time ago, uh, uh, Anishinaabe uh, have, uh, have this protocol where you're not supposed to point at anybody or, or, or anything. Uh, because it's uh, uh, one of the things that that uh, that I found out was uh, Anishinaabe big a long time ago didn't point the, uh, uh, anywhere because they were afraid that if they do point with their fingers uh, said to a certain area, uh, they would be pointing to a spirit that that was out there. Uh, 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 at that time, and then the spirit uh, would say, "Okay, why is that guy uh, pointing his finger at me? Why is he? Why is he? Why is this Anishinaabe uh, acknowledging me? Like, you know, what uh, uh, what does uh, you know what does he want?" And the spirit would say, "You know, probably would say to himself, you know, what did I do?" Uh, and so that was uh, uh, something that. Uh, we uh, we uh, we knew that uh, uh, not to uh, not to do that, and it's just not uh, you know uh, us uh, from the northern uh, 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 northern Ontario did that, but Anishinaabe uh, all over that would you know uh, that would do that, uh, uh, and they would know uh, about this uh, pointing with the lips. Uh, thing. And also, uh, another thing is, we're always busy with our hands uh, doing something, working on something, uh, cleaning fish, uh, doing uh, work or something like that. And, we're, and our hands are always busy with doing something. And somebody will ask you something, I need to it like that. So where's the knife or, or something like that? And then we just point with our lips. Uh, and so then people would know right away where uh, uh, where the knife was and stuff like that. Thank you for that. Thank okay. you. 
I learned, I mean, I've told you before, I've learned a lot from your book, but I appreciate you explaining that. And uh, I noticed we do have a question for Bob. So let me uh, put that to Bob and then we'll come back to some other questions. So um, the question for, uh, for Bob is, um, you mentioned that the lacing, uh, I think you're talking about the lacing on your snowshoe was specific for long treks for hunting. That's what the person was, was hearing uh, you say. So does it mean that there are different types of lacing depending on what you're doing? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. there is uh, like, uh, I was gonna mention that this, less, this lacing here is, uh, is the best that I've, that I've, I've tried all kinds of lacings. And my dad taught me this and he was a trapper for the longest time. And so I keep that lacing. That's the best one I've come across. But there's another one for women. We call them woman lacing. It's not like this. It's really simple. I can't. I don't have. I can't show it to you here. But with these things here, if you have this kind of lacing, it doesn't slip. It does, your feet doesn't slip sideways. Like with the woman's lacing, you just you know, they didn't. Women usually just kept around the camp. You know, just uh, maybe go. Uh, a rabbit snaring or stuff like that. So they didn't need that heavy duty stuff. It's just a fence, this fancy thing. They just had a simple tie on, just uh, just a uh, walk short distances. Mm -hmm. And uh, today I find that uh, today I see in stores like Canadian Tire, they have this big rubber, uh, this rubber thing you can, uh, you can put here with a slit on it and you put your foot in there. And uh, the thing with that is it slides your feet slide mm -hmm. which, uh, which you're, uh, when you wear uh, when you wear moccasins. Uh, it's a little better if you, if you wear big boots, a big uh, one of these uh, sorrels or something like that. They're good like that. Mm -hmm. But the thing with walking with boots for a long time, especially with uh, the spabiche, you know this, uh, these uh, webbings, if you use uh, if you use uh, hard stuff like hard rubber and stuff like that for like boots, you eventually wear these things out really fast compared to a moccasin. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's other straps too that uh, that are, they have buckles on them. I see how you can just buckle them up and stuff like that. Those things are a pain, especially if they get wet and uh, because you get wet there, these things get wet after a while because uh, when you're walking for a long time. These are hard, easier to dry right away. Mm. But with these big, thick leather things that uh, that they, you see on stores sometimes, uh, they're good, you know, for just short, you know, if you want to do a short, uh, just short walks in the bush and all that and come back to your car. And <laughs> those, those, are, those kind of things are good for that sort of thing. But if you're a, if you're a heavy duty hunter, if, you, if you're a, if you really want to go hike for a long way off trail, this is the best one you can get. That's great. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. We have a few minutes left um, before we just have to get to some, some last things. But um, Eli, I'm going to bring you in here because I wanted to ask you a question again. Uh, if I was offline when this came up, that's fine. We can move on. But I, I think it's a good point. So as I say, we have about three minutes. Um, so you talk in your book about your grandfather delivering mail for the Hudson's Bay Company using a toboggan and sled dogs. And I just wanted you to just touch on what your family's relationship was like with the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, Muzzinaga is one word that is associated with that. That means a credit. And our dad uh, 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 with the Hudson's Bay Company was uh, before uh, all of the, the trappers uh, went uh, in the fall uh, to go to their trap lines, they had to go and buy all the food, the gasoline, uh, traps, uh, food, uh, and all that. But most of them didn't have that much money, so uh, they would go on credit, and then they would come back uh, uh, two days before Christmas, and then sell their fur to the Hudson's Bay Company, and then uh, pay their 
pay, pay their fall credit, but then they would also uh, uh, need uh, uh, supplies again for the winter and the spring hunt that, that they're going to go through. So they had to uh, use up uh, that, that money that they got. And then some, sometimes there wasn't enough, so they have to go on credit again. Uh, to uh, to go uh, hunting, but the Hudson's Bay Company, my uh, when uh, uh, the history of it was that uh, they uh, Hudson's Bay Company was on the uh, east side of James Bay and Hudson's Bay uh, a long time ago, and then they came uh, uh, no the east side, then they came to the west side, and uh, and then they made all these uh, Hudson's Bay posts uh, in all these areas where the First Nations communities are to this day, uh, like Nestandaga, uh, Nibiomik, and uh, Abmatung, uh, uh, Agu King, uh, all those uh, uh, Northern uh, communities. And uh, that's where the Hudson Bay uh, put their Hudson Bay posts uh, there uh, a long time ago. And uh, one, of the, one of the stories that my, uh, our mom used to tell us was that uh, every spring, uh, uh, Anishinaabe babies used to go out and do spring trapping and stuff like that. And, uh, and Bobby would attest to this there where uh, there's no self-respecting uh, Ojibwe that would stay at the, on, the, on the reserve uh, when the spring hunt was on. So, but, Every spring uh, in, in those uh, communities, uh, somebody had to stay behind to look after the Hudson Bay manager and the Hudson Bay clerk because they didn't want uh, this community, uh, those communities didn't want to be faulted by losing a Hudson Bay clerk or a Hudson Bay manager at that time. So there was always this one person that had to stay behind <laughs> and look after uh, and look after these guys. So, uh, so there was that. Uh, but our uh, Chomashiba uh, uh, traveled from uh, Fort Albany to pick up the mail and went inland uh, to all these other Hudson Bay posts uh, to, de to deliver mail and packages uh, and uh, uh, things like that. So uh, he would travel with his dog team uh, a sleigh and just his snowshoes, uh, his gun, and uh, and travel to all these uh, to to all the to all the communities, uh, delivering uh, delivering mail uh, at that time. And uh, one of the things with that is my company was my dad, uh, in in Agua King in Oguki, uh became a clerk uh, for the Hudson's Bay Company. And uh, 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 he had a young family, uh, my uh, three sisters. Uh, and uh, uh, what he found out was uh, all, all these uh, uh, people from, uh, from the community would come in with all their furs and realize that these guys were making uh, a lot more money than what he was making as a bay clerk. So he quit that job as a Hudson Bay clerk and decided to go trapping. <laughs> and uh, so, and there was, uh, yeah, we had uh, uh, this uh, mm, transactional relationship with uh, with uh, with the Hudson's Bay Company uh, for for a long time, and uh, I think. Our generation uh, were the last was the last generation that saw, uh, you know, the end of the Hudson's Bay Company uh, at that time. Thanks, Eli. Yeah. yeah. I, so we've got some other questions coming in, and I I think we can take if we can get really quick answers for these. If not, um, I can look at um, sharing them by email. But just two quick ones that came in. The first one um, for either Bob or Eli, if you can answer just in a minute. Um, when, when you were on the river in the summer, did you live in tents or did you have a cabin? And in the winter, did you stay on the river? 
Uh, we stayed in tents in the wintertime and also our main camp where I, and Bob is, is like that too. Uh, our dads uh, had uh, log cabins and, that, and those were our main camps. And then we would go, uh, we, were, we were still had that nomadic way of life because uh, one section of our trap line uh, would be hunted out uh, for, for a while. So we would leave that alone. Then we would travel uh, to another area with just our tents, you know, those uh, canvas tents, uh, minor canvas tents. And that's, and that's where we live. Bob? Uh, oh, <laughs> his mic is up. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, and we okay, yeah. traveled in the summertime uh, on these big 16 uh, foot uh, freighter uh, uh, boats and dog teams in the wintertime. Remember that? Yeah. 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 Just, yeah, we lived on uh, like our, in the wintertime, we lived in log cabins, it was central where we were. But during the summer, in my young days, uh, when there used to be commercial fishing, they used to go all over the place. So we used to travel up and down the river and uh, and then we, uh, using tents, it was easier. Yeah, yeah. And let me put one more question to you. And then um, uh, depending on how long that is, we can try for the last one. Um, but the question is, were there trees that far north that you could tap for syrup? Um, uh, we never tapped anything that I know of, uh, up there for yeah. trees. That might be a no on that one, but keep yeah. thinking about that. And if you have an answer where you can share it with me and I can, yeah. I can try and share it in my follow-up email. Um, and one more uh, question you refer to using guns. Would you have preferred to use something else like a bow and arrow? Me, myself? Yeah, I tried when I was young. I tried. I tried using a bow and arrow. I, I think my arrow my arrow bounced off the moose. So I still stick to my gun. <laughs> okay. Well, we're gonna we'll leave it there. Why not? That's a good a good point to leave it at. Um, I, what we're going to do now is I'm just going to switch the screen here. And um, there's just some things I need to share. I want to thank you so much for all the stories you shared and um, all that we learned about your book and, and all that we learned about as you were growing up. Um, I'd love to hear more stories and I wish we had more time tonight, but I do need to just move to a final um, slide to show. So um, if you'll just indulge me here, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, I'm just gonna enlarge this here. So what I wanted to share before we uh, get going tonight, um, a reminder that the Indigenous Voices series offered through Western University's Office of Indigenous Initiatives features a monthly session to complement the program series with Eli Baxter. On February 24th, 4 p.m., the session will be hunting and maple syrup harvesting. Uh, we're going to put the link uh, for this session in the chat. You can register using that link uh, and you'll receive a confirmation email through our friends at Western uh, with information on how to join that meeting. So thank you so much. And um, I'll just add as well, I'll just stop sharing my screen because you will be seeing that link in the chat. There it is. Thanks, Dana. And um, on March 22nd, Eli will be joined again by Bob. And we're also going to have Cody Groat uh, from Western University. Uh, he's going to talk about um, residential schools along with Eli and with Bob. Um, and uh, Cody is at Western University. And he is with the uh, Indigenous Studies and History Department. So he'll join us then. And that again is March 22nd. You'll see the link for that to register in the chat as well. If you do not have a London Public Library card, feel free to email me directly. That also will be there uh, for you to, um, uh, yeah, just check in with me. I'll send you the link um, you're taking care of there. So just, as I say, I'm so honored that we can have this discussion tonight, that we get to learn and hear these stories and share them with each other. Um, I am really grateful for that. Um, so I'm just going to um, share one other uh, quick thing in the chat. There's a lot happening in the chat. So thank you for um, 
putting up with all of that, but it's a short survey. Um, if you could um, just take a few moments to just let us know what you thought, um, any other um, comments on our programming and what we can do in the future, we would love to hear that. So um, what we'll do, I do see we have about three minutes, which is wonderful. Um, so at that point, I can take about a minute each and turn it back to Eli and Bob for some last words, if you could. Eli, we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, sorry, I, uh, uh, I really can't do the, the chat thing uh, at the same time. <laughs> uh, but uh, thanks for uh, uh, all your uh, uh, information and questions. And uh, I would like to uh, do some uh, uh, something afterwards about uh, gathering all these uh, questions and maybe answering them in uh, some type of format or, or something uh, later on. But uh, we'll see you later. <laughs> Thanks, Eli. And Bob, just some parting words from you too. So glad you could be here tonight. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say thank you to, uh, to every that participated. And uh, again, I'm always honored to be, uh, to be asked to join in this kind of sessions and uh, give some of the knowledge that I have, uh, you know, from, uh, from our neck of the woods. And, uh, and I wish everybody uh, a good night and uh, stay safe out there. Be good. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. And I see a comment here. Thank you, Miigwech, for such good medicine. I think it couldn't be said better than that tonight. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. And we'll be in touch uh, in a little bit. As I say, these recordings will be on the library's YouTube site uh, after the series ends next month. But um, a big thanks. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.